odds and everything feels like a struggle and we were yelling at each other on the way to church. You've heard this. So, I mean, no less than Maya Angelou, the great American poet, once said that she herself suffered from imposter syndrome. She said, I have written 11 books, but each time I think, uh-oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody, and they're going to find me out. This is, I think, what a lot of preachers feel Saturday evening, or so I've been told. This is going to be the week where I get up and nothing comes out. This is going to be the week where I just completely fumble the ball. This seems to be a universal sentiment. And so these are the emotional conditions. By the way, it really should be called imposter phenomenon rather than imposter syndrome because it's that widespread. The other emotional condition that informed the writing of this book was burnout. Burnout was originally coined, or it was really originally talked about in terms of Gen Z uh, having to work three or four jobs and, 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 and hustle culture in Brooklyn, uh, yet dealing with massive student loans. And the sense that people who were 25 felt like they were on the verge of retirement because they were so heavy laden with, with, with things that they were being asked to do, and they weren't being paid as much as they ever thought they were going to be paid. So, but then COVID happened, right? And burnout was used to describe, uh, what did we call them? Essential workers, right? Remember that? <laughs> um, uh, people in healthcare were starting to feel very burned out. Anyone in the helping professions, Lord knows clergy felt burned out. All of a sudden, in addition to being a fundraiser and a CEO and a leadership guru and an expositor and a preacher and a pastor and a hospice chaplain, <coughs> you were also asked to be a television producer <laughs> and make very low budget TV every week. And then you had these sorts of people that said you should never meet in person again, and these sorts of people who said you should never, ever not meet in person, and you were stuck in the middle, and everyone said this is impossible. And you had pastors burning out at record rates. You've heard all this. But you also have young mothers burning out, and you had, you had men in their 50s saying they were burned out, and you had teenagers saying they were burned out. So burnout seemed to be something that was universal. Burnout and imposter syndrome, I thought those were some, some good starting points to talk about what it's like. Those are spiritual conditions as well as emotional conditions that we could talk about. So what does this have to do with anthropology? Well, those of you who are theologians know that anthropology doesn't just refer to a class that you avoided in your undergraduate study. It doesn't just refer to the study of sort of, you know, tribes and in the jungles of Costa Rica or something like that. It, um, it, Theologians uh, talk about anthropology is your operating conception, your operating view of human nature. Everyone has an anthropology. Everyone has, even if, they, even if it's conscious or not, even if it's articulated and precise or not, we all have some sense of what human beings are like, of what men and women are capable of and incapable of. Um, when you say the phrase, I'm only human, or that was a very humanizing thing, or that was a very dehumanizing thing to do, there's a content to that statement that you cannot run away from. So it simply means what we believe about human nature. And whether we realize it or not, we all have one. And our personal anthropology creates expectations creates expectations in our relationships, in our jobs, in our marriages, in our ministries, and of course with our own relationship with God. Our anthropologies bearing on our worldview cannot be overstated. Some anthropologies lead to serious disappointment, anger, cynicism, and bitterness. Other anthropologies can be energizing and life giving what they can't be is non-existent. The contention of this book is that seeing people as they truly are, as opposed to how we would have them be, is a crucial ingredient in generating authentic compassion and lasting love. That is to say, it's a crucial ingredient in surviving the ministry, right? So in the sake of the book, I try to chart anthropologies on a continuum of high to low. 
uh, it's like a barometer of human potential. On the high end, you have the sunnier estimations of what human beings are like, the grand visions of human enterprise, the sort of Star Trek uh, view of uh, be all you can be, the army. Um, optimism, essentially, when it comes to the human condition. On the low end sit the more sober estimations. We find understandings of the human spirit as something that veers by default in a more malign direction, that as a result you and I cannot flourish without assistance or constraint. We find descriptions of people as finite, blind, and in many cases quite weak. You can tell already that I'm a proponent of low anthropology. And I'm a proponent of low anthropology because I'm a Christian. Um, but, but again, this, this book builds towards Christianity, not from Christianity, okay? It's, it's trying to make a compelling case that leads to grace rather than starts with sort of the existence of God. Um, What's ground zero for anthropology is graduation speeches. Graduation speeches always contain anthropologies. Let's go to the first one right here. You guys know this guy. This is Steve Jobs, who once told graduates of Stanford University, he told them, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow know what you truly want to become. That is a high anthropology, and it sounds great when you're 22. Right? Let's go to the next one. This is Anne Lamott. She says, everyone is screwed up, broken, clingy, and scared, even the people who seem to have it more or less together. They are much more like you than you would believe, so try not to compare your insides with their outsides. That's the full quote. So a high anthropology views people as defined by their best days and greatest achievements by their dreams and their aspirations. A low anthropology, though, assumes a through line of heartache and self-doubt and that our ability to do the right thing in any given situation is hampered by all sorts of outseen, outs, uh, unseen factors. And so we have to note, before we get to ministry, we have to note what our response is to Steve Jobs and to Anne Lamott. Because on the one hand, Lamott's words sound harsh. If I had my fourth grader come back from school and tell me, guess what I learned today, Daddy? Everyone is screwed up, broken, clingy, and scared. I would say, son, we're going to a different school. <laughs> or you just sound so discouraged and de depressed. Let, let, let me give you a pep talk. Let's go eat some ice cream. Let's go do something fun. Um, and, 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 but beside that, is everyone really clingy? I mean, I know... I am, <laughs> but what about, you know, Mark down the street, he certainly seems to be killing it, you know, uh, with that new renovation. Um, <laughs> I live in a town that's just people renovating houses from what I can tell. That's the, the great American pastime. Um, so, uh, but say you had a tough day at work. Say you fumbled the ball, as I talked about earlier. Say you um, spoke insensitively to a loved one. Well, all of a sudden, Anne Lamott's words might feel like you might feel recognized by them rather than burdened by them. And, and Steve Jobs' exhortation on a bad day might not feel so great. Maybe on a good day, you think, oh my gosh, I have everything I need internally already to become the next enslaver of the human race. Right? Put away your phone. Uh, uh, but no, I mean, you, you get to be 45 and you think, well, where was my good intuition? <laughs> my brother sure seemed to get all of it and I got none of it. You know? What, what's wrong with me? <laughs> Steve Jobs lied to me. I followed my heart and it didn't lead me where I thought I wanted to go. Or it led me where I thought I wanted to go, but it wasn't where I should have gone. Right? This is the great impasse of being middle-aged. Lamott's admission conveys, conveys compassion, and you can feel your shoulders unknot. Steve Jobs' advice convey pressure. And this is the great irony of a low anthropology. What sounds insulting is actually liberating, and what sounds liberating at first is actually oppressive and embittering, especially when God is in the equation. 
when the Holy Spirit is alive and well. Much of our despair today, especially as pastors, the American church, I'm convinced it's fueled by a superficial view of human nature. It's a default view that flatters us with fantasies about our capacities and our motivations, but fails to account for the actual data of our lives, leaving us lonelier and more burned out as a result. How many people do I hear from in my congregation who feel burdened by the pressure to perform an ideal version of themselves? Not just on Sunday, by the way. Sunday sometimes is the only time they don't have to do that. They feel it all the time. The need to assert one's own happiness, to assert one's own supremacy and, and competence all the time. That is the definition of exhausting, and it's akin to what we talked about last night in terms of justification. So this book, Low Anthropology, is an attempt to highlight the counterintuitive truth that weakness and limitation can function as a doorway to compassion and unity and grace and faith. I'm convinced that if you want to see an increase in hope and peace amid the engulfing mercilessness of today, especially if you want to communicate anything approaching grace, you must begin with the low anthropology. And not coincidentally, I found that religion in general and Christianity specifically make very little sense in the context of a high anthropology. After all, what was Christ's great mission statement? It is not the healthy that need a doctor with the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's why I'm here. There are three pillars of a low anthropology. We'll start with the first one. You can go to the first slide. Taco Bell is the first. Actually, that's that we're going <laughs> to we'll get back to Taco Bell in a second. Any Taco Bell fans here? Okay, we got five honest people, <laughs> and the rest of you liars. You need to live a little moss. Um, limitation is the basic understanding. It's biblical, but it's also simply uh, practical. That we are bound by time and biology and all sorts of other factors that shape our behavior. We can only stay awake for so long uh, and can only be in one place at one time, despite what my children's soccer coach thinks, right? Taken together, these factors make it possible for a machine to discern what we're going to do next. All of our lives today are dictated by the algorithm, the almighty algorithm that Steve Jobs sort of helped pave the way for, which is so successful because we're so darn easy to manipulate. We are only so easy to manipulate because we are finite and limited creatures. Proclaiming that we are all finite creatures sounds elementary, but the truth is we often receive the opposite message, and we sometimes receive the opposite message at church. Advertisers and motivational speakers promise us that with the right products and strategy, we can transcend most, if not all, of our limitations. This is where the concept of the human being as a machine comes into view the metaphors that work their way into our relationship. What do we say? Oh, I haven't really processed that yet, right? Processed, you have a processor? Um, <laughs> I, need to, I need to optimize that part of my daily schedule. I need to hack this problem at church. I need to figure out a way to be more efficient. We start to laud efficiency as a great virtue that is non-existent in the Bible. Um, but limitation doesn't just mean that there are limits to what we can do. It means there are limits to what we can know. All of us are confined by our context and our perspective. Complete mastery is not within the grasp of incomplete people. This is as true for archery and stone masonry as it is for particle physics. It is true when it comes to your wife or child, there's always something more to learn. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians? Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. You don't have to be a Christian to subscribe to that sort of view of limits of knowledge, but it's certainly there. It's certainly there. In relational terms, this means there's always one more drawer to open before you can make a definitive judgment of someone else. And that goes for you yourself too, though. A low anthropology holds that the judgments we make of ourselves, hardened as they may be, are not watertight. 
Just as others can surprise us, we may yet and often do surprise ourselves. Surprise is a key category for the low anthropologist who's interested in grace. Grace is the great and glorious historical surprise. <laughs> right? I love, I think surprise, life is a surprise party for the person who believes in God. Um, that's the first pillar, and um, it's just, it's not necessarily a moral thing. It's just, it's just no limitation. Secondly, though, we have doubleness, and that's where Taco Bell comes into the equation. I don't know if you know this, so I lived in New York City in the uh, early, to, well, about the mid-2000s, the aughts, as they are called, and uh, <clears throat> it was a time when the New York Board of Health decided that all fast food restaurants had to prominently display the calorie counts of uh, the food that you were going to order. And so you would have Taco Bell menus that looked like this, which looked like, I mean, very dense uh, and overwhelming when you walked in. Now they were trying to increase the health of the people in New York City. They were trying to get lower health care costs. They were trying to combat obesity and such, all the things that people do. But they did not account for doubleness. What they found out was that when they listed the calories, what happened? People ate more than they'd ever eaten before. The New York Board of Health believed what most high anthropologists believe, that the problem with misbehavior is simply a matter of information. The problem with misbehavior is not information. We know, <laughs> I think I have it, uh, we know, I do not understand my own actions, Paul writes, for what I do not, what I do, what I do not want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me, for I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I can know what the calorie thing says, but I find myself ordering an extra gordita with a quote unquote, with a diet Coke, you know? Um, the great American way. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want, is what I do. This is doubleness, and it comprises the observation that our agency, our personal power, is more restricted than we like to think it is. We lack autonomy, and that is very painful, especially when it comes to the matter of addiction. Addiction is the great example of doubleness. Um, it has more to do, is less to do with capacity and more to do with resolve. The issue is not that I don't know what to do or can't do it, it's that I don't want to do it. Um, a low anthropology takes its cue from Jesus and from Paul and ultimately for, and also from Augustine. It understands that people only change when their desires do, when their heart does, when one emotion is supplanted by a different one. That is to say, a high anthropologist looks at problematic behavior and sees a lack of information or awareness. A low anthropologist looks at the same issue and sees a lack of agency or power. What's holding this person back? A low anthropologist does not expect fresh facts to change convictions or to alter deeply rooted patterns in our lives. Now, this is the great, again, the great alchemy of a low anthropology. It frees us, instead of creating despair, it frees us to have compassion on ourselves and others and to see how much we all need each other and God. I'll put it for you this way. One of my best friends in ministry, um, uh, I had not seen him for about five years at this point. Uh, we helped, tried to start a, we, a church plant in New York City, and it failed. And uh, when he got there, he was full of, fresh out of seminary, full of all sorts of optimism and excitement about starting a church. And he's a very gifted guy. Um, but uh, it's one thing led to another, as it often does in church plants, and uh, the financial crisis happened. And uh, he left the city with his tail between his legs defeated. And I remember wondering to my wife whether he would continue in ministry. He'd really taken a beating from both the city and from the church, right? Five years later, we're reunited. And I noticed right off the bat how rejuvenated he seemed. His wife gushed about how well the new job was going. The church was packed. A new building was in the works. You name it. But most of all, I could tell my friend was spiritually reengaged. He was walking with the Lord in a closer and more excited way. 
What was, I was wonderful, I was talking to Clark from True Face last night, and he was telling me about the, 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 the spiritual conundrum between, uh, if you had to choose between uh, pleasing God and trusting God, which one would you choose? And uh, this guy looked like he had finally gotten to the second one. He was in a, a, a relationship of love and trust and, 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 with, and grace with God. So I asked him what had changed. What was the secret? And without skipping a beat, he told me, Dave, the honest truth is I've gained a lot more compassion and patience for people since I realized that everyone uh, is pretty much insane. <laughs> Myself included. And I laughed. I knew he was overstating things, but what he meant was that in a few key ways, human beings, and indeed, yes, Christians, tend to act in ways that seem obtuse, counterproductive, and just wrong-headed. And once you accept that, you stand a chance of loving them. You may even find that you want to serve them over the long haul. Barring this realization, you will bang your head against the wall. How many f colleagues in ministry have I heard give some variation of the refrain, why won't they do what I tell them? Why won't they read the Bible more? Why won't they pray more? Why won't they pledge more? Why won't they come to church more? I've told them they need to, but they won't do it. They must hate me. And guess what? I hate them too. You come to resent the people that you're entrusted to shepherd. And so we get to the place where we get to the third pillar. Let's go to the next slide. Calvin and Hobbes. <clears throat> the third pillar of low anthropology is self-centeredness. People are so self-centered. The world would be a better place if people would stop thinking about themselves and focus on others for a change. Gee, I wonder who that might apply to. Me! Everyone should focus more on me. The determining factor in human affairs isn't simply that we are limited in our knowledge, our capacity, our resolve, that we are that we're, uh, overcome by conflicting desires. The issue is that those desires so often veer towards ourselves, such that what we want comes at a cost to other people. So this is the, one, of the great, one of the many great Christian insights. We're not just flawed or broken or only human. We are not rational beings making healthy choices, improving ourselves into posterity. We are limited, conflicted, and self-centered creatures tied in knots of our own making. We know the right thing to do, but we cannot seem to do it with any consistency. Moreover, we don't want to do it. Things are not okay. I am not okay. We are all in profound need, not just of help, but salvation, deliverance from God. This is serious. Self-centeredness is serious. It's a moral dimension. It's sin. It's another way of talking about sin. If you multiply our self-centered tendencies by the number of people in the world and the number of minutes in the day, you get a world that looks a lot like this one. Not this church. This church feels very holy. Um, the way that, how do we talk about this today in secular terms? We talk about bias. Bias is, 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 the, is, the, is the accepted terminology for talking about a low anthropology. Bias says that you are actually, uh, all sorts, your behavior is informed by all sorts of things you're unaware of, and part of the bias is that you can't even see it. Now that's very close, but in ways that it, you act in ways that are detrimental to yourself and other people, that's very close. It's sort of a way to try to take the judgment out of sin, but it actually increases it because it doesn't lead you anywhere. It just leaves you there. Anyway, um, why do talk about this today? Well, yes, there is something wonderfully uniting about this. There is a sort of a fresh compassion we receive for those who are different than us, who vote differently than us, who believe slightly differently than us, knowing that they are just as driven in self-centered ways as we are. But I was asked to talk to you about Christianity in particular. How does this play out? How does a high and low anthropology play out in Christian circles? And you know it already, but I'll give you some, maybe this is some fresh terminology for you. Because high anthropology is the tie that binds together nearly every account of religious burnout, disillusionment, and um, just basically uh, antipathy. It's the foundation of legalistic and oppressive forms of religion, without which they cannot find oxygen. A high anthropology approach to religion devastates people. I'm speaking mainly about Christianity, but you can encounter it in other religions as well. Anytime you hear someone refer to a religi former religious observance, 
with some form of, I just couldn't keep it up anymore, you were in the vicinity of high anthropology. And how many times have we heard that? So the story I tell in the book is the story of Kara. It's an extremely real person, but it's also a composite from, from, from this, the, the many, many stories like this I've heard. Kara, I'm going to read it to you. Kara. Her family goes to church about once a month, but are not very involved. Kara believes in God, but it's a private thing. Adolescence presents its usual set of challenges, but she makes it through more or less unscathed. Off at college and away from home for the first time, however, Kara gets lonely. It makes a couple decisions she regrets involving alcohol and the opposite sex. Her roommate can tell she is floundering and invites Kara to the campus Christian fellowship. At the fellowship, she meets a group of gregarious and kind-hearted Christians. They're friendly and funny and not at all weird in the way that some super religious young people can be. A 20-something campus minister gives a presentation about the gospel and Kara hears for what feels like the first time a message that connects with her actual struggles. God cares about her, he says, understands what she's going through. Moreover, God sees her as she is, warts and all, and loves her still, so much so that he sent his son Jesus to be a beacon of love to the world. The world, though, rejected Jesus. Yet Jesus did not reject the world in turn. Instead, he died to bring lonely, broken sinners like her to God. She is seen and she is forgiven. And what's more, the God of the universe wants a relationship with her. It's a beautiful message. And it's miles away from the coldness of the meritocracy and the dog-eat-dog social life which dominate her campus. So she decides to come back. At first, life among these Christians is warm and full of laughter. They talk about deep things. They share their hopes and fears. They pray together. They organize service projects. It's a community that doesn't shy away from the dark side of human nature, yet holds out real hope for redemption. But then something curious happens. The more Kara gets involved, the more pressure she starts to feel. Perhaps there's a subtle indication from others in the group that she should be praying for longer every day or is too passionate about Taylor Swift. <laughs> Questions about her romantic life cross the border from friendly interest into investigative concern. It's never said outright, but slowly the come-as-you-are atmosphere that brought her in is supplanted by an emphasis on personal growth. Sometimes this is conveyed in terms of behavioral purity, sometimes in terms of cultural transformation and activism, but soon faith begins to feel like a project rather than a refuge. Before she knows it, her faith has turned into a new ladder to climb, a spiritual extension of the meritocracy that she thought she was escaping. This time, though, the approval of God Almighty hangs in the balance. Before long, Kara starts running every potential action and relationship through an internal calculus of holiness. She becomes an anxious wreck, and finally, in a fit of relief, Kara decides to, quote-unquote, break up with Jesus. Life is hard enough, and other people challenging enough to get along with without an added layer of existential pressure. I've heard... Variations of this story more times than I can count. Kara encountered a mild form of what happens when Christians embrace a selectively high anthropology. The thinking goes like this. Before a person becomes a Christian, they are limited, doubled, and self-centered. When they surrender their life to God, he forgives them their shortcomings and imbues them with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit then enables the Christian to be a little less limited, doubled, and self-centered, a little more like Jesus. Thus begins the process of growing in holiness, or what is known as sanctification. Because a low anthropologist understands the allure of personal control, they might offer a few caveats to that schema, lest the Christian fall back into performancism. They might venture that in the drama of sanctification, the actors are more or less the same, but their parts differ. The Holy Spirit plays more of a leading role than a supporting one. God plays more of a leading role than a, uh, what is a supporting one. You and I are what the Bible calls vessels. That is, when it comes to driving the plot of goodness and grace forward in a person's life, we take a back seat to our creator in terms of both initiative and credit. A low anthropologist would therefore caution believers about miscasting the spirit as an extra dose of motivation that's grafted onto the human will. More often than not, the Holy Spirit's activity does not follow a linear, quantifiable pro pro progression 
It blows wherever it pleases, John tell, Jesus tells us in John 3. Usually bringing a person into deeper dependence on God who maintains top billing throughout. The persistence of sin in the life of a believer undermines a selectively high anthropology. It creates a cognitive dissonance which must be reconciled or the person splits in two. Because when trials come and willpower fails us, a high anthropology religion is of little to no comfort. It assumes more agency than a person possesses and it assumes they have it within themselves to partner meaningfully with God in healing the world in themselves. Let's go to the next <clears throat> now to find out who's been sabotaging my walk with Christ. I think it's funny. Um, that's a low anthropology meme for you. It's not the only factor. None of the memes are not comprehensive, by the way. Um, there's, there's caveats. There's qualifications. But a theological term for the outlook I'm describing is semi-Pelagianism. You're all familiar with it. And unfortunately, it describes a great deal of American Christianity. You may have heard this position expressed in terms of meeting God halfway or co-laboring with the Spirit or through the injunction to let go and let God. We naturally want to have something to contribute to our relationship with God, something by which we can be measured and possibly distinguished. Again, this is where the fork in the road happens and people decide they want to please God because that's all they know from everything else in society rather than trust God. Um, uh, the problem should be self-evident. And I heard, uh, I heard uh, Joe talk about it beautifully last night. Questions of exactly how much of a role we play in the God-human tango play the, plague the semi-Pelagian, fostering an anxiety and judgment that push people away from Christianity altogether. Uh, a religion of high anthropology in this way pits a person against themselves in a battle they can't win. More than that, it pits a person against God. God becomes positioned as a taskmaster and judge for whom nothing is ever good enough as opposed to a loving parent who happens to also like you. And therein lies the true viciousness of a high anthropology, the adversarial relationship it sets up between creature and creator. Low anthropology religion holds that the Holy Spirit works through people to accomplish acts of extraordinary charity and love. Human beings experience victory and growth in all sorts of miraculous ways. But this often happens in spite of their resistance to it or ignorance of it. Good works are more a matter of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing, as Jesus says in Matthew 6. Sanctification feels more like losing than accruing, more like getting smaller than getting larger. A high anthropology slowly transmutes Christianity into its opposite. It turns it into a treadmill of moral striving. The church transforms from a hospital or hospice for sinners into a schoolhouse or even a boot camp for saints. The emotional engine of the Christian life switches from gratitude, which we heard about last night, to obligation and in some cases fear. Both motivations may yield similarly altruistic and justice-seeking actions, but only the grateful heart will have the stamina required to love one's neighbor over the long haul. So what does a religion of low anthropology look like? And we can discuss this a bit more in my uh, breakout. Well, first, I'd say that a religion of low anthropology holds what I'd call a nosebleed high view of God, like a book of Hebrews view of God, right? To the extent that we are small, God is large. A high anthropologist looks to God as helper and guiding force, but in the long run has a hard time remembering that he's also savior. A religion of low anthropology understands that God, as the AAs understand, does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He forgives, he saves, he resurrects. More than being someone to emulate, Jesus delivers those who fail to emulate him with any consistency. A low anthropology is therefore not shy about the word salvation. My father, who actually coined the term low anthropology, uh, he's a theologian, he articulates the inverse relationship in the following formulation. He says, the lower your anthropology, the higher your Christology will be. The, higher, the, the more robust your pneumatology will be as well. You don't have to be a charismatic. But um, 
But a religion of low anthropology is not shy about sanctification either. It simply puts the onus on God to do the growing. God, Jesus, is the gardener who cultivates the soil of our hearts and makes the rain fall. You might say that a low anthropologist holds God to his promises rather than attempt to usurp the reins because it's not happening fast enough. As such, a religion of low anthropology ultimately boasts a more optimistic and hopeful view of change and growth than its alternatives because it puts the keys to that change in the hands of the only person who can actually do it. The power to heal, the power to make right lies with God and is not subject to the vicissitudes of human vision and vigor. God can use those things but is not dependent upon them. Secondly, though, a religion of low anthropology does not recalibrate the law of God or propagate rumors about the human ability to fulfill it. Instead, it allows God's voice to speak at full volume to provoke what Giles Frazier once called a crisis of capacity. Jesus wants us to feel that we cannot do what morality demands, and he does so because he's pointing to something beyond morality. He's pointing to faith. He's pointing to faith in himself. And this is true. Jesus knows that telling people to have faith only goes so far. He knows that only when we have exhausted our own capabilities will we look in faith toward the horizon. Only when we have been unburdened of our illusion about what we feel we quote unquote deserve will we appreciate what we've been given. So my sense from reading the Bible is that Jesus confronts us with our limits, not to discourage us, but to engineer a situation in which the phrase that he uses, what is impossible with man is possible with God, might find traction in your heart. Faith in God begins where faith in oneself ends. Thirdly, a religion of low anthropology will not shy away from death. Um, We can talk about that more in the next session. But because uh, we believe in God as Savior, you have to talk about death. And if it's as hard in a culture that runs away from death in every conceivable way and shunts it off into homes where we never have to see it, that turns the parlor the de- where the bodies were displayed in the front of the house into the, what a, the living room. I mean, we just can't handle it. <laughs> Get it away from me. Right now, I'm an American. Um, A church with a low anthropology is a place where we can bring our failures and our shame. It is a place to lay those things down, to hear about second chances and third chances and fourth chances. This is my my chance to tell you to watch the Netflix documentary, The Saint of Second Chances, about baseball promoter Mike Vick. Just do yourself a favor, I'm not gonna give you away, but if you like baseball at all, indeed if you like America, And if you like grace especially, you will love this depiction of death and resurrection and grace given to those who are undeserving. Um, But that's what church is. It's a place to go and not be turned away no matter how overwhelming your limitations are, by what forms your self-centeredness has expressed itself or how much damage your doubleness has done. More than a place to come together, the church is a place to fall apart. And there's always room for a few more faces. This is why we emblazon over the arches of the red doors at our church, at least, which signify the blood of Christ covering you as you walk in, where it says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Those are the people Jesus is interested in. It's not the bright-eyed and bushy-tailed type A achievers. He's interested in sinners. He's interested in people struggling with shame, who are weary, who are burdened, who cannot, who are, who, who, whose lives are defined by low anthropology. That's the category we come to find out of people for whom uh, God died. And that is the category of people that God wants to have a relationship with and use to bring about his purposes in the world. So that's all I have to say. Um, do, we, do we have one more, cha- oh actually we have one more amazing picture. This is a, uh, James Tissot was an Impressionist painter in France who uh, illustrated the Bible. And all of his, it, it, unbelievable if you're looking for a uh, painting for your sermons. I'm sure you've used him before. But this is his, uh, what our Lord saw from the cross uh, painting. 
And I love it because it, we talk about uh, the ground being even at the foot of the cross. You've heard that phrase. Here you have uh, Mary, and you have the women, and you have John, the beloved disciple, but you also have the, the Pharisees, and you have uh, the, the Roman centurion, and you have the guards, and you have people coming from near and far, and you have children, and you have beggars, and you have what look like uh, royalty, and people on horses, but people also on foot. And what you see is that the ground at the foot of the cross truly is level. And that from God's perspective, this, uh, the lower your anthropology, the higher your Christology will be. Can you see yourself in that crowd? That's where we want to be, right? But that also gives us an element of like, look, you can almost sense the grace, the love with which Christ is gazing down upon that crowd. That was painted, I think, in 1886. Um, but James T. So I think we'll leave it with, with him. Um, what our Lord saw from the cross. Thank you for listening.